John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you gonna do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporlin's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balance for TEV. Well, come on, I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity, TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Corel, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge, so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc. has all your solutions down cold. And then that's where we started having issues. If you look at the iPro, they say the iPro has two stages, right? Subcritical and transcritical, basically. That was one of the issues was that nobody had ever really ran into ambient that low, like minus 20 degree ambient. We tried everything. Like we, we took saran wrap, saran wrap the crap out of the condenser and was not making a difference at all. So the problem being is that it's following a subcool set point, right? It's looking for a five degree subcool set point. The iPro is looking for a five degree subcool set point. So what ends up happening is subcooling gets so high that the HPB is throttling open. And when it's throttling open, it ends up overpressurizing the flash tank. And so you have such a low load on the store, but all your compressors are running and you're sitting there vary, variating the speed of the lead compressor on the drive, like between 80 and 100%. And it's minus 20 outside. All your cases are at 10. And it's all coming from your flash tank. Literally all of it. The whole load of the rack. So we, we found this fucking around in the 326. I fat fingered up set point on these racks we were having all these issues with. These like small customer, they don't have much case load. We were having the racks kept crashing. I fat fingered the subcooling set point and got the or I made it too low, got it to open up and it was doing exactly that. It was, it's running the pumps. It's, it's running everything off the flash tank. It actually works fairly well to keep that rack running in the middle of the winter time when it's cold. Interesting. 
it, it well, works fairly well to keep it running. We'll have to talk off air about some of these uh, fat fingering set points. <laughs> so the other thing is tactically that I pros not rated for that cold outside. Is it? I didn't know that. If so, what is it? What it's UL listing isn't rated for that or something. So like we were just talking about this today, me and Jake were technically there's supposed to be a cabinet heater in there. Oh, okay. I don't think that store had a cabinet heater in there. Cause obviously you're not going to really run into that where you guys are, where you guys are, but we get the opposite end of that. It's like colder than shit here when it's 60 by Brett. Right. Yeah. He's got he has his sweater on with his cardigan. I think it's 80 out at my house today. It's not too bad, but I know where I'm going. It's going to be 115, 120. We hit 92 today. So we actually did a startup. It was like a couple of years ago. It was a Carnos up. It was probably one of the first ones they did up here north. So it was 4,200 pounds of CO2, blast freezers, all stainless. Yeah. Kind of what you're doing. So it was in Michigan. It was two degrees outside. All the CO2 was in a Connex box. Holy crap. <laughs> that sucks. Nice. We could not, for the first six hours, we could not get this thing to start. How, we, how, what pressure were the, bottle, were the bottles at? They were at like a couple hundred. Yeah. So they would, nothing would move. Yeah, obviously, everything's warm, so nothing would move. So we ended up having to go get propane turbo heaters. Those big, long, like three foot long ones or whatever. Yeah. Like, Turbo heaters, we had to put them in the Connex and hot box the Connex. It took two and a half hours for the Connex to warm up enough oh, for the, to move the CO2. Crazy. That's insane. Yeah, I've had it where like we've had low ambience or whatever before, and I'll just take a map gas towards the side of the bottle. That, and that it's worked, but it was slow, extremely slow. But uh, other than that, it's funny, like people look at me crazy when I do that or whatever. I'm like, it's not gonna hurt it. And I'm like, it's just transferring the pressure from one one space to the next. Like it's got somewhere to go. I don't start heating it up until everything's open. Oh know? yeah. I'll be sitting over there with a 40 tip trying to get all the liquid out of the bottles because oh. it's so expensive and I want to try to get everything out of the bottles we can. Absolutely. Do you yeah, charge right in the flash tank or do you charge them in the session? So there's been a lot of controversy about this and I've been doing it like this and it's been pretty good. You just got to pay attention to what you're doing. I charge it. After the liquid dryer, or I want to go through the liquid dryers. Yeah, so yeah. He is awesome about this. And Zero Zone is too. Yeah, Zero there's Zone is extremely awesome about it. So there's a packed angle valve after there's a dryer. So you could shut the you could shut the flash tank off and let it go through the store. I let it go through the store, feed through the cases. The reason I do this is I have more control over it this way. So if it's feeding through the store, if it's feeding directly in the flash tank and we got a problem and we just dumped a fucking metric shit ton of CO2 pressure yeah. in there and the flash tank just spikes up, I'm fucked. Yeah. I'm in relief. So going through the store, so I have less, I'm going to boil off because, I mean, we're feeding cases that are hotter than shit. So I'm boiling off the expansion valves, the controller, whatever, yeah. but I'm also able to get more liquid out of those tanks because I'm, cases. yes, because I'm pulling down to suction, generally right. low temp. So right. I'm pulling that down. I get the tanks down to 200, maybe 250, 300 pounds, depending on what the medium temp cycling off at. So I'm on average getting five to 10 more pounds of gas out of each tank. That's cool. Yeah. yeah that's basically the same way I do it too. It really depends. It It depends where i'm at because nine times out of ten before i even put gas in that system i go through the wiring and the program of every single rack i go through every single wire i make sure it's tight i make sure it's strict and my biggest I, I don't care who programmed it i don't care if they're the best programmer in the entire world everybody makes mistakes function um, testing it too like the program yeah. oh yeah absolutely i i run the hpv open and I run it closed. I run the BGV open and run it closed manually. And I sit there right next to it to where I can hear it. And I want to hear it bottom out. I want to hear it over close. And if I don't have time, then I'll just charge it at the flash tank. And if I'm pretty confident that the HPV and BGV are cycling properly, I'll run it at the flash tank. But I also, like back in the day when you couldn't really get into the iPro and look at all uh, settings as far as milliamps and stuff like that for the valves, I would just 
charge. And as I'm charging, I would monitor the rack to, to watch the valves. But now that everything's opened up to the public, basically, I'll cycle every single valve open and closed as far as HPV, BGV, hot gas dump, liquid injection, oil, solenoid, all of that. So my only complaint with the iPro is like the last time, a couple of times I tried to use the Visiograph to override the valve, it doesn't work. You can go through the E2 and do it, or even the site supervisor. So on E2, it works, but like the Visiograph, it does not work. Yeah. I, I don't even mess with that thing. I just make sure that it's communicating with it and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's useless other than setting the baud rate and address. Yeah. It's nice to be able to see, but yeah, it's... Uh, the update rate is faster than the E2, so I, I will use that when I'm first initialing, starting up compressors. Usually I always run, like when I go to, when I'm above my triple point, I'm adding liquid, I always run. I'll never run the drive compressor because I'm always crunched for time. So getting to the drive compressor is one of the last things I do as far as going through the drives parameters and all that. So I'll run like the second compressor and I'll watch my, I'll watch that visiograph or that, that visio screen and watch it change just because the update rate is quicker and I can see in real time what my pressures are doing and what my valves are doing. That's one of my favorite things to do is start the first compressor. So uh, this is what I've been doing lately too, like charging oil. Like I generally will charge it all into the separate or the reservoir or separator. So I'll feed the separator first, make sure, and then mm -hmm. I'll pressure kind of low in the rack. I'll charge up the reservoir as far as I can get with, it. Or vapor. Yes. Or no, with oil, oil as oil. far as I can. And then I start clicking the compressors over. So that way I... You're using the pressure from the reservoir into the... Yes. Push the oil. Yeah, I do this. Do the same thing. But what I'll do is I'll actually use a vapor tank. You'll pressurize the reservoir to push that oil into the compressors. I have... I do that, but I've been using an electric pump. So I've yeah. been able to get pressure in there to actually do it. What do you use? What kind of electric pump? So it was a gear pump. Like the one you put on the end of your drill or what have you? No. So this one was a hydraulic. I had the first version was a soda pump. Worked pretty good wow. until the coupling and I got pissed off and threw it. Man. What? I, I keep smoking them. Like, I had a little electric one. It was just a cheap one, but I smoked the damn thing. I like those drill ones because you can hook up the drill to it. Put one line in your oil, one line connected to your reservoir or what have you. But so we have a hydraulic pump now. That's pretty badass. Small hydraulic pump. And it, it can make a, I think it's six or 800 PSI. I hope my boss, John Garcia is listening to, will, will listen to this episode. <laughs> We're using that now and that, that's able to make enough pressure to push it in there. And it's able to actually get it in there to the point where like, it's fairly simple. It can handle the viscosity. Yes. It's so far it's been okay. Yeah. And that's like, the thing I've run, I've ran into is like the little pumps that I'm using can't handle the viscosity and it ends up over amping the motors and smoking the motors. Well, I burned up the soda pump putting screw oil in. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Like a hundred viscosity or something like that? Yeah, it was hundred weight oil. Yeah. It did not like it, but that's how I've been doing it to test to make sure that I have no plugs in the line. I, everything's good. And then the actual high pressure valves work and then test all those because that's been a huge issue. Getting the oil in there, getting enough in there to make sure you're running and you're not going to have problems is like key. And that's how I also test to make sure like my level sensor, like on a Hill Phoenix CO2 system, the level sensors are working. Okay. I fill up one compressor at a time I, and I'll do it directly from the flex combiner. I'll go into, I think it's like DO2 that actually pulses the solenoid and I'll go in and I'll manual on that output from the flex combiner. So that way I make sure, you know, the program's right in that manner. And then I watch it actually change. I watch the light change state. And then I watch the relay change state. I watch, I watch it close the input to the input board and then trigger in the E2 or E3 or whatever's running it. It definitely, like when, obviously when you know how a system works from A to B, or sorry, from A to Z, it, it can help increase your efficiency a lot better as far as getting a, a rhythm. Yeah, a rhythm. Perfect. Yeah. Ha having that, that rhythm going, especially when you're starting like these CO2 racks is like key, but like you said, the more and more you do, the more comfortable you get. Another thing that like, like a lot of guys miss in the beginning was like, I don't know why they messed it up so much, but getting the flash tank and the high pressure transistor backwards. I see oh, it yeah, every time. time. 
So like yeah. I'm super diligent about that to make sure I'm actually disconnecting the wiring on the high pressure one to make sure it yeah. goes open. Same thing on the flash tank one, making sure it goes open. So uh, honestly, literally what I've been doing the last few startups, it's been so bad that I just pull all the wires off. I trace them out and I rewire the whole thing how I want it every single time. Yep. Just every, like, every time it's wired wrong. Yeah. Every single time it's wired wrong. I, shit. I think two or three startups ago, a manufacturer actually put the HPV, like physically welded the HPV and BGV in backwards. They welded. Typically you have, what is it? A CMT and a CCM, Danpos valves. I can't remember which one it is, but they put them opposite or backwards. They put the CCMT. So what is it? The CCMT they typically use on HPV and the CCM is typically on the BGV and they put them in backwards. So we had to cut them out and swap them. Damn it. That's... And they didn't even have the standalone controller in there. Like it had to be shipped. It was at the time when iPro or when Emerson or Dick Seller was having problems with getting iPros because basically it was like at the beginning of the phase out of the 326. And then, so there was this huge rush to switch over to the iPros because that was like the only other system available. So they didn't even have it. So luckily on that store, I had to wire everything as it was anyways. And one thing I'm not liking is some of the different manufacturers that they don't realize that when it goes in, when the iPro or goes into phase loss or fate, yeah, phase loss, it closes both of the valves. So they're still, they're putting high pressure switches on the compressors and, but they're wiring the compressors normally closed. And therefore, what was that? It goes boom. Yeah, it goes boom. Exactly. You, I think we were talking about earlier about how you've only seen one manufacturer have, have them hit the 1740 relief. I'm sure there's going to be a second manufacturer added to that. So here's my thing with that. Okay. If you lose the controller, you're dead. You're done. Shut the rack down. Yeah. Shut the Shut. rack down, close the valves and just try to maintain. So that way you lose the least amount of refrigerant as possible. Yeah. Don't try to run the rack. Like there's no point in running the compressors normally closed. Like you would a normal system because I agree. let's be honest here. If you lose that controller, you are done. Like you, you are not going to run. Like you do not have enough standalone systems in place to run that. It's not going to happen. So all you're doing is causing problems by wiring that normally closed. Yeah. And so with this specific manufacturer, I think we talked about it earlier, but their low pressure control trips the time delays. So the only, so think about this way. You go into phase loss, right? Your HPV and BGV close. Your compressors are wired normally closed. Or so let's say you go into network loss. Technically, you go into a network, well, a full network failure. That th those valves are going to close. Yeah, it's, yeah, because everything's not reading right or what have you. No, they might. It might still run standalone. But if you go into phase loss and all those compressors come on, and those valves close, and you go boom. The only time this man, the way this manufacturer has it wired, the only time those compressors are going to actually have the time delays be in play is when the compressors trip on low pressure. So you would actually have to blow the reliefs first, release probably, I don't know, 60, 75% of the refrigerant, and then the time delays would actually come into play because you would actually be going off on low pressure at that point. Yeah, the, the time delays to me are pointless if that you just wire them normally open and just I call it oh, then you don't need the time delays that same manufacturer wow. it has an issue with their oil drain system so they're actually that manufacturer is not using they have an optical eye but they're just pulsing mm -hmm. on time they're using a dc relay i know exactly what you're talking about yeah. or dc solenoid immersion cpc boards are not rated for dc contacts correct well, it, they are rated, but it's only like 1.2 amps or something like that well, from DC voltage. The cycle counts is like not even a smidgen of what right. they, they would be if it's AC. If it's AC, we're actually losing those relay points like crazy. Really? Just yep. They're yeah. burning. Up. Guys will change them. The last couple more months will burn up. So what I've been having guys do is put them on an SCR. Okay. And we're running an SCR, and then I had them use a digital output board 
Right on. So I'll you know, have them throw it on a digital output board and use that to cycle the SCR. And so far, it's been pretty good. But yeah. that's a huge issue we've been seeing with those. Yeah. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm sure I'll see it in the future. We'll have to talk about it more offline. So I want to know the manufacturer. That way I can figure it out in the future. But yeah, so basically after I finish adding my oil, which this rack that I'm going to be working on, each rack holds, I think it was 60 gallons of oil. Yep. And I told my boss, I was like, I'm not pumping that in. <laughs> or at least the project manager. I was like, you guys got to give me a pump because they're like hydraulic pump or something because I am not pumping that in by hand. And so after I add my oil, I pretty much double and triple check my HPV operation, my BGV operation, run the valves closed, run them open. And then as I add liquid, I'm like a fucking pinball all over the damn rack as I add liquid because I'm checking every single analog gauge just to make sure I'm not overpressurizing. I'll typically manual my fans to 100%, depending upon the ambient, I'll force on the water just so I can get a consistent ambient coming through my condenser. So hopefully I don't have any surprises as far as my condenser goes. Obviously, one of the first things that any startup tech does is go straight for their condenser and make sure that's cycling right away. And then from there, it's basically going through, getting a full charge in the system. How long does it usually take you to charge a, a brand new system? From start hour. To huh? Yeah, per hour. I like to think of when I'm charging the system because I'm pinballing all over the place, I don't dump in the full charge initially in a half an hour. So I'll charge a little bit, make sure and start in introducing more and more load onto the rack as I'm charging instead of just dumping the full load on the rack all at once. Pens where I'm at. Especially with a Hill Phoenix rack. Like I, I found that even like some loads, if you dump the full load on that Hill Phoenix rack, the super heat's so high that you can actually friggin' take the compressors off on thermal. If, if I'm in an Aldi, I'll just let her eat. Yeah. Like it's. What's your ambient though that you're typically dealing with? Oh, uh, it's usually, we've only, it's only been like 80 degrees. It's warm and ah. In the winter time, we definitely let it eat because it usually doesn't have, an, it usually doesn't have enough load on it to actually not let it eat. Right. But if I'm in a smaller store, I'll let it go. But if I'm at a larger store, I bring it on you know, a little bit at a time. So, yeah, I generally will charge the entire thing in the flash tank. I'll get it up to like 60 to 70% charged in the flash tank. And then I'll get it up to where it needs to be in the flash tank. And then I'll start introducing load. So that way it all in there and I don't have to, I don't have to put it in later. Yeah. Typically, typically that's what I'll do. I, I'll let it run, get 80% level in the flash tank and then start inducing load. So actually like James, like on the like larger stuff. So if depending on how easy it is to start it all up and I, how easy it is to get into valves, I've done this too. I have throttled the suction uh -huh. rack. So if we are bringing on like a smaller rack and I'm just trying not to overload the rack, we'll, we'll throttle the suction a little bit. So that way it gives it a little bit more relief. So if it does pop up on you, it's more controllable. That's one of the things I like about the LMP racks is that you can actually throttle a, a, a stepper valve to actually reduce your load. Yeah. What was the one job that you called me on? We were talking through it where we, I don't know if it was a low ambient condition where we changed the subcooling set point to basically get more. Uh... Me and James were talking about, so like the, we ended up rate lowering the subcooling set point. Lowering or raising? Or raise, it, raising, I, raising the subcooling set point. Okay. So what I ended up doing was I worked with Emerson. And so before everything used to just be a fixed value, right? For the subcooling set point. Yeah. So, what I ended up doing was I got Emerson to rewrite the, it was like pulling teeth, but I got Emerson to rewrite the description file so that we could make it a variable set point based off of ambient and just use the combiner to change the set point based off of ambient. So when just wrote the logic so that when it got below, we started at 30 degrees and that's honestly too high. 
But when the ambient got below 20 degrees, we changed it to 10 degree subcooling set point. When it got down to zero degree ambient, we bumped it up to a 15 degree subcooling set point, And that seemed to counteract it a lot better. And yeah. it, it, I couldn't even write the logic to where it's variable. Like you could go tenths of a degree or what have you to, to change the subcooling set point, but I don't think it's necessarily like necessary. Yeah, Brett, I fat fingered and actually lowered it and it was so damn cold out. It was keeping the, the, the HPV, wide open. Yeah. HPV wide open. But see, that's where I'm a big microthermal fan with that because on the 700 boards, like their two valve control is fucking awesome because yeah. you have different, you have subcooling or subcritical set points. You have transcritical set points. You could change this, the subcooling values. You could change the way the fans react. So the fans that are going off of drop leak temp run off pressure. That's, That's, cool. Cool. That's so the it, best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Running off of drop leak pressure is the best way to control it instead of running off drop leak temp. Drop leak temp runs so shitty. Like anytime the ambient gets below 60. Oh, especially when they, yeah. Think about when the ambient's at minus 20. We had that Arctic blast come through Chicago for two weeks straight. Yeah. And it was minus 10 to minus 20. And these fucking racks were dying all over the place because yeah. fans come on for a split second. Boom, dead. Nobody was prepared for it. Nope. And then the way that all these manufacturers are tying all these condenser fans together and running them all as one, one speed and all on at once, it just doesn't work in the applications they're using it in. So yeah, so that's this store that I'm going to be starting up. The only thing that we're going to be seeing from the condenser is when it has an alarm. Yeah. So you're using get the Gutner controllers and see, this is yeah, where like, yeah. don't like what Carnot does with that because they let the controller be standalone. Yeah. That's what it, it's going to be. It fucking can. It, 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 I well, hate it. even Gutner. It's the Evapco that they're using on it. And I, I haven't done an Evapco standalone condenser yet. So that's going to be interesting. I'm not a fan because A, you don't know what's going on. Like you get an alarm signal yeah. from it. I rather control the condenser fans. If you need to make an adjustment remotely, they do it. Like now you can't do it. Now you're yeah. going on the damn roof and trying to figure this out and make it, make adjustments. And today's episode is sponsored by the RefRush Shield RDP series differential pressure monitors from Westermeyer Industries, now available for transcritical CO2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerin.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N.com. It's, I don't know, they, if it was all tied together and able to be read it'd be cool but that's one of the limitations of microthermal unless it's a lawn works product or on a tartar card you're not getting it but yeah that's a huge thing targets doing like the circuit enable stuff with like their stuff but the circuit enable is such a pain in the ass to like start up cases the problem that i'm having is teaching the ems or like the low voltage guys how to read the prints for that so um, it's been difficult. I was looking at them the other day. I'm like, God, like they, they, they've, they used to be awesome. Like the drawings were fucking amazing. Yeah. Been hit or miss lately. Well, I've been running into, they keep sending out the wrong contactors. Keep sending out the wrong contactors. Yes. But, Which contact are we talking about? So they'll send out a lighting contactor, a normally closed contactor instead of a normally open contactor. Ooh. And so like you, you, for the walk-ins, they're all for the walk-ins. They make their REMS panels or what have you that go above each box or whatever. Yeah. And so they'll send out normally closed contactors. So you flip the switches for, you flip the power to, to your walk-ins and the fans come on. I'm like, what the heck? Fans aren't supposed to be coming on. And then when you start running, if you didn't catch it beforehand, then when it calls for the fans to turn on, it turns fans off. It's energizing the contactor and opening it. That's definitely one of the, one of the issues that we've ran into. Another issue, I think we were just talking about it at that summit that we all went to, was Hill Phoenix is piping some of the cases backwards. Like the, the labeling, the, they'll have a suction and liquid labeled at the top of the case, but then they cross it inside the case. 
And so your liquid yeah. ends up feeding into the suction and your suction ends up feeding into the, to the valve. So uh, if a fitter is doing a store and it's their first one, there's always at least one or two cases. The easiest way I've found to find it usually is like your suction trains to be reading like flashing pressure. Yep. And so the good thing about the Dick cells is you can set a max pressure in the Dick cells and it'll actually shut them off. So it doesn't allow the valve to open. And, and that thing will literally alarm max pressure. And then you pretty much know right away, okay, we're at 515 PSI on, on my suction line. What's the problem? So. Yeah, that's a big deal. I wish they would start putting in circuit switches back at the rack for this. In, and individual? Individual circuit switches, not like individual cases. Not for each case, but for the lineup. Yeah. For the lineup and just putting it back to a 16 AI board and just using it as a circuit enable. So like you could toggle these things on at the rack. It'd be so much, it would make startup and starting this stuff up after repairs so much easier because you could stage cases on and off like individually. That's a lot, That's a lot of extra wire to run though. It's not though, because you're not running into the case controllers. It should all be done. That should all be done off of you could run it directly to an input yeah you could run directly through an input and then you could have but they want both a a physical enable and they want a digital yeah but you don't need that like you don't need a physical enable and a digital you could have a physical you could have a physical shutdown for the whole store run through and then you could have that be part of the software disable so if the e2 shuts it down or that circuit switch shuts down, same thing. It's, it'd be, it would combine the inputs, either or. So that way, you, if the hardwired shutdown may not shut it down as you're working on it or doing something or doing startup, but like the circuit switches still would. You could probably do it with a total of two flexible combiners. Yeah. With an E2 or E3. And you could control, because you, you typically get, what is it, eight, eight DIs and eight, eight DOs. So you could have X amount of cases on one DO and one switch for each DI and each DI is one lineup. And then that, it would literally be just some extra wiring. Cause it, as far as like the Hill Phoenix programs go, the combiner is already there for certain shutdown. You, it would be relatively cheap and easy it, yeah. for a couple, like a thousand dollars. Probably you could probably install the switches in a board to, in order to do it, but it would make startup in working on the rack much easier. Otherwise, if you got to go through and do Dexels, you got to go through and you got to override the valve in them. Yeah. Bureau. And, and- it would honestly even make it easier when I'm talking to somebody over the phone, an apprentice over the phone on pumping down a system or what have you. Yeah, it, it definitely would. Have you been seeing a lot of issues with the pulse valves being wired wrong? Like, like yes. certain, certain case manufacturers like hot to neutral and solenoid wires to solenoid wire. The 120 volt solenoid, how do you screw that up? <laughs> they wire the, like the, so they wire the pulse valve, the coil together, both wires of the coil together, and then they wire the hot and neutral together. Holy shit. So you blow a fuse or you blow a breaker right away? Case controller. Oh, so you fry the case control or the relay that is connected to it. They so are- we just just door and we went to go fire up a lineup. They turned, the electricians turned the power onto it. Dead. Dead instantly. Wow. No, like, fuck was that? Four of them. Holy shit. <laughs> Work short somewhere. So I'm looking Three through. Four. I don't find something on like the, the fans or anything. So I, I haven't fired again. Boom. Dead. I'm like, wow. What the fuck is happening. And all at this point, all the case controllers are fucked anyway. You can just smell them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, boss. Hey, you. Uh, can you do me a favor? I need about five cans of that liquid smoke. Can you send it on over yeah. to me? So fuck these controllers. That up. Next day, please. So I'm like looking, and I'm like, I go to the pulse valve. So I'm like, wait a second, where the fuck is that wire go? I'm like looking at, I'm like, why are those together? Son oh of my god, bitch! And it's dude, it's gotten to the point with a certain manufacturer. I find it at least one to two cases a store now. Serious. Yeah, like I've gotten to the point where I've blown up so many fucking pulse valve controllers that I I check them all now. I have them on my fucking truck stock. We actually do have a couple, like, but like, I we've had so many issues with them being like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. It's like hot to neutral. It's got to be one person at the factory that's doing that. Just one. 
That guy sucks. Where is this going? Oh, it's going for CPI over in Chicago. Oh, Kevin's getting it. Fuck it. Just let it run. Let it run. They can't even say that. It happened to me in Oklahoma, too. <laughs> I do check transducer wiring because I, I have had a transducer short out of Dixel before. It was only one oh, time, but was it because it was pro? Was it because it was programmed for the four to twenty or what? No, it, it was programmed zero to ten. But really, the problem was is that moisture because they make up all the connection inside of the coil, and so that's one of the things I'd really like to see is get back to making up the connections outside of the coils, like on top of the box or case or what have you. All the cases, the connections are made up outside, but on, on a walk-in coil. Most of the connections are made up inside. So with whatever, if they use those plant style jelly connectors or dolphin connectors, really, I prefer dolphin connectors. They're just easier to work with. Judas. What was that? I said Dude. fucking Judas. You get your ass out of here with those dolphin connectors. Huh? <laughs> you get your ass out of here with those dolphin connectors. Uh, both of you guys are hater, haters on the dolphin connectors. I can hate those things. They trigger the shit out of me. Yeah. If you make up the connections in an area that's not going to have moisture, they work great. But that's what they're designed to stop. Supposedly. Supposed. When... He's getting <laughs> patients out there. Yeah. In my opinion, yeah, yeah, they have dielectric grease in them. But when the freezer's getting down to minus 20, it's not going to last very long. So here's my big bitch with that stuff, like the terminal blocks. I fucking they're hate horrible. They're horrible. Why does a coil show up to a job site with a 20 foot transistor cable curled up in it. And then a 20 yeah. sensor cable curled up in it landed two, two inches away on a, yeah. on a terminal block. And they don't trim it down. And literally the coil of wire is taking up the entire side of the coil. Like rip that left the factory like that. And you put a terminal block in there and that left the factory like that. And that's how the customer expects you. They want you to trim it out inside there on a terminal block. That is going to ice up and is eventually going to short out. Yeah. Why would you leave 20 foot of wire in there where a heater is going to burn it? That's one of the reasons why I want to go back to having all the connections made up outside. It's not that hard to add a piece of conduit, a junction box right on top, and make up your connections in that junction box. 100%. So have, what was that? I said 100%. I agree. Yeah. You're going to have a low voltage and a high voltage no matter how you look at it. So, therefore, make up the connections in that junction box. Get rid of that terminal block, get rid of gel or dolphin connectors inside of the coil and get rid of the massive rolls of wire inside of the coil. I, I cut them down. Like it triggers the shit out of me. I cut them down. Me too. Yeah, I, I can't do it. And then here's the other thing. So technically those terminal block connections should have dielectric grease on them. Should. Because. Uh, it's Carnot. I hate it. Dude. They take on the bits or compressors. They put the massive jelly like literally they somebody has to go in and scoop it by hand just full handed and they dump it inside of the compressor and then they take a trowel and smooth out the top of it basically <laughs> okay, they we did this store with them and it was all 208 and they don't have 208 power in canada so they ran all these compressors these are all were 40 horse bitsers the massive compressors they ran the hot two wire to them like it's like welding cable so they yeah. they was the wire it was like welding cable wire so like a really, really fine yes uh, fine count or what have you yes yeah, so bits are only makes a certain size lug yeah so the wire didn't fit completely in the lugs so they shoved the shit in there and, and then right. yes side to side yeah l2 to l3 touching each other and the guy went to go through the first compressor to test it. Boom. Oh my God. He's fuck it. Throws number two. Boom. Oh. I'm like, Stop. we started going through it. And it's like every half the compressors are shorted. Oh, so it's, it's in there. I am covered head to toe. <laughs> and it's fun. <laughs> I am literally inside these pecker heads of these compressors digging out this dielectric grease to get to these fittings. And I'm not, he's, James isn't exaggerating. They literally took a trowel probably and smoothed over the top. Yeah. They, There's that. Or they there. took, they probably had little like pint containers and they just dumped the whole pint container inside of the, the so, pecker head of the compressor. I am covered 
my tools, I can't even hold yeah, on to them. Like a semen specimen. <laughs> <laughs> All up my arms. Like I am, and it's fucking cold outside. So it's not even warm. Like, I, like, I am just fucking furious. Like I wanted to kill somebody. <laughs> And they threw it in and said it was part, it was uh, that was part of startup. That wasn't oh work. part of startup like, these issues. They like, covered head to toe. And then the guys said you gotta put that all back in there. You guys gotta fill it back fuck up. I am. The fuck I am. Yeah. Oh Kevin, I'm crying right now. <laughs> that shit that that shit is so transmission fluid to me is just fucking disgusting. Like, Did they like, at least tighten the lugs? No. There was fucking lugs that were loose. LMP like LMP doesn't type shit inside of the compressor. Oh, uh, you guys are killing me. Or the racks. <laughs> yeah. And so LMP is really notorious for wiring the line to the load and the load to the line yes. on the drives. Look, it's not just them. It's been a lot of manufacturers here lately that that's happened. So like really? I, it's gotten to the point now where I check it. So like I'll yeah, short the L2 and like I'll just, I'll keep the power off and I'll just shove a wire in between the contact or L1 to L2, and I'll go on the drive and make sure it's shorted on the actual like drive input yeah. or the, the power input because I sh- Dude, uh, that want to drive off the wall with the wrong drive. It will. I watched an old timer do that one time. Guy like he uh, looks at me and go, Hey, Mike, make sure you go through there and you uh, you wire that right. Yeah, kid, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah. So he's in a Munners unit. This motherfucker wired the but wired it backwards and goes turns the power on goes oh yeah fuck <laughs> he goes it was a power outage and they need another bottle of smoke yeah but like, yeah it'll uh, it'll grenade that fucker fuck yeah it will so I think it's I think it's the control techniques drives that will actually alarm and lock out and they will really? actually yeah they'll actually realize that it's wired backwards that line power is not load. yeah every other drive doesn't it just sends her to jesus yeah someone called me the very first time they did that they were like yeah i really didn't know what was wrong with the vfd so i had to get i had to get it i had to bypass it for the time being i'm like and then you can come out here and we'll take a look at it i was like so what did you do he just took the i took the line that was going into the drive and moved it over to where the wires are to go out of the drive. I was like, put it in follow up anyway. And I'll see you in about a week. I was like, why are you busy that long? And I was like, nope, probably going to take you a week to get a new fucking drive. <laughs> oh man. I was like, don't ever do that again. You're going to do that. Put it on the loads or the line side of the drive. Like yeah. th- not the load side of the drive. Like you're basically introducing AC voltage where AC voltage is not supposed to be. Yeah. You're in you a DC circuit. Yeah. Well, yeah. That- it technically okay. is a DC. It's outputting DC voltage, but in the waveform of a sine uh, wave. Yeah, in the sine wave of the AC. So that's been a huge issue, like on a lot of manufacturers. And then just vibrations has yeah. been another big time. And uh, tell them about the one where you extended some pipes and fixy fixy. So Zero Zone had us extend discharge lines out, and it's been fucking phenomenal so far. What do you mean by extend discharge lines up? They ran the discharge lines, I think it was eight inches before it ninety. Okay. And it pretty much stopped all the vibration. Really? At every frequency? So far. So I still had to delete some frequencies. We the still had to, probably so like it, 50 hertz or sorry, it, 30 hertz. Yeah. This last store wasn't that bad, but the store we did before that, it was fucking horrible. Like we had a lot of frequencies that get deleted, but other than that, like re- extending the discharge lines out. Now I have noticed this. We had some early LMP racks never vibrated ever, but the discharge lines were like twenty inches before they ninetyed. Um, wow! So it came out and then went straight back and then ninetyed straight down into a header. So Hydra just had us add extra hydros hydro absorbs to this rack. They're just gonna wear out. So. Now they have literally probably a half inch before the 90. They they have they had us add extra hydrozords because I guess they keep blowing the 90s. Yeah, and they're going to keep doing it because I, from my take is that I want to 
talk to somebody about this, but my take is there's not enough straight pipe before the header from going to that coming out of the compressor. There's not enough straight pipe and the velocity is too high before it hits oh, the four at nineties. Yes. Yeah. Cause every yeah. time one break it's on a, comp- it's on a, a compressor with a 90 very close. Tell me what you think about this. I was just at this store today as Kaiser rack. It goes through like not talking about compressors, but this is my HPV. It nineties hard. It's actually a service valve. So they're trying, I get it. They're trying to make it to where the HPV is serviceable to where you could actually pull it out and service it or what have you. So they've got an angle valve before the HPV and an angle valve after it. And it's hard nineties, like at the HPV. That's a lot of velocity coming through there. That's what I'm saying, especially transcritical. It is and it isn't. If you really think about it, it's going to, it's still going to be pinched down. Yeah, but the regul technically the HPV is the regulator at that point, so it's controlling that velocity. But yeah, you're right. It's controlling the velocity, but it's still going to have a. That's a fucking. Mm, I don't know about that. Yeah, we'll see how it ha- how it works out. I honestly don't like the overclamping. Anytime I see them overclamp stuff, it just mm-hmm. breaks. Or they wear or clamps wear out and they rub through. Yeah. Yeah, they put that rubber liner on the inside of the hydrosorbs or whatever. These one, these ones are really thin hydrosorbs. The other thing, I don't know why anybody doesn't use them. Those hydrosorbs, they, the blue ones Hill uses, they're like medium. They're like their medium temp line of hydrosorbs. Yeah. So they make a high temp, high temp. It's rated for 300 degrees. Oh, uh, okay. That's none, cool. none of these manufacturers are using that. Those discharge lines on the TC compressors, those fucking things are like 230 degrees yeah. at time. Yep. So like, every single one of the hydrosorbs are those medium temp ones on this yep. discharge side of the system. And they don't last. Yeah. Have you seen those new super hoses that they're using? Which ones? The uh, like orange Go Max or something? Yes. Uh, so those are 120 bar, which is right at 1740 working pressure. But I looked them up today and they're 600 PSI burst pressure. I haven't used those ones yet, so I'm kind of i want to see the longevity longevity. so we have three costcos with them and they're four years old now we haven't had one yet nice well what is that the same manufacturer you're telling me about where you can actually have the tool to make your own pressure hoses no it's different but the same design here there's just a different manufacturer i think it was dn6 as the part number on there or something no, so, I, yeah, I was going to say, Kev, explain to that, because that's that was cool as hell. I didn't even know that these, this existed. So I forgot the name again real quick, but there's a manufacturer, like you could, Hill uses them a lot, those gray hoses, like the, their pressure yeah. control. So that is actually a kit you could buy. Oh. And you could have it in your band and a roll in all the ends, and you could make whatever hoses you want. You can crimp your own hoses? Yes, on yeah. site. And you could do three-eighths, half-inch. You could do quarter inch you can make your own capillary tube hoses but you can make your own hoses you go that'd be cool to keep on a service van for sure service van and i'm trying to get one for startup we run into problems with this all the time but or like a retrofits if you're doing like gas changeovers that would be killer so you guys have to land all your connections and stuff do you personally start up have to land your all your connections so i have to do everything i have to do vacuums i have to do connections like right. check, I'm doing all the connections and then verifying all that. If one of our good EMS electricians is free, he will usually land everything. Yeah. He's usually about it, but like he's so damn busy just running jobs that like I hardly ever get them. So I'm me or my other guy, Jake, are usually trimming all the panels out and doing all that stuff mm-hmm. and having to do all that on top of doing vacuums, which I would love to come into a job. I haven't come into a job that's ready for startup with vacuums pulled in two and a half years. Really? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it's everybody's so pressed for good help. Well, it's not even that. It's just pressed for time. It's just go. I'm usually getting there and they're still piping. Especially some of the stores we do, they don't. They're on a fucking insane schedule. Right. I'm curious to see the big push in the next few years from our certain customer with how much they're trying to accomplish every year, how it's going to impact the industry. It's going to be fucking nuts. It's going to 
it's going to make so much work that there's not the load or the, there's not the manpower for right now, but it's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's going to make a lot of people a lot of money. That's for sure. Yeah. Hopefully us, but I think we're on the shit end of that stick. <laughs> but either way, I would definitely want to figure out that kit for those hoses. What's the rating of those hoses after you crimp them in the field? So you had to, I didn't look at them. They're pretty high. I want to say they had high pressure hoses. I'm assuming it's probably like a fitting that goes inside of the hose with also the crimp fitting that goes around the outside. And that's what you're crimping down is the outside. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it was still a good high like pressure barbed fitting that goes inside the hose. Yep. Yeah. So the smaller hoses obviously are rated way higher. Yeah. Other than that, I don't yeah. know, Brent, you want to stop it and then make it a, make this a, a, have them back on again. Yeah, we can definitely for sure. Uh, yeah. We're at like what? Two hours right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm breaking this up into two episodes already, dude. Are I, you? Already, I'm in the point where I'm getting to be toast and there's too much good content. that's going to get missed otherwise. Yeah, for sure. Right on. That's, that's man. Ed James. Yeah, yeah, James. Hey, man, it, next time we'll have you on again and just we'll keep rolling. You know what Sounds I mean? Good. Yeah. Is it good content? No, it's terrible content. Awful. Absolutely <laughs> awful. Hey, we'll see you guys later. Maybe James will be better next time. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Yeah, fuck off.